The only way a person can be more superior than the other human being is by piety. It is by righteousness. It is by God consciousness. Not by wealth, color, or by nobility. These are the guidance given the Holy Quran for universal brotherhood. The fifth pillar is Ramadan, a song. That every adult Muslim should fast, should abstain from having food and drink from sunrise to sunset in the complete lunar month of Ramadan. The Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah chapter 2, verse 183, that Ramadan has been prescribed to you as it was prescribed earlier to the people who came early, before you, so that you may learn self-restraint. The reason for fasting has been described in the Holy Quran for self-restraint. And the psychology that tell us today, that if you can control your hunger, you can control almost all your desire. That's what the Quran says. Ramadan has been prescribed for you so that you may learn self-restraint. You may control your desires. If you can control your hunger, you can control almost all your desires. And there are various benefits. That if a person can abstain from having alcohol from sunrise to sunset, he can very well abstain from having alcohol from the cradle to the grave. If he can abstain from smoking from sunrise to sunset, he can very well abstain from smoking from the cradle to the grave. It gives you an opportunity to improve yourself. I call it the overhauling, like how every machine requires servicing. Like you service your car every three months, every four months, your motorcycle every five months, etc. If you allow me to call the human being the machine, I would say it is the most complicated machine on the face of the earth. Ramadan is a servicing of the human body. One lunar month, every lunar year. Servicing. There are several medical benefits, even of Salah. I wouldn't like to go into the details. But it also improves, increases the intestinal absorption. When you fast, it increases the intestinal absorption. These were in a nutshell, the five pillars of Islam. If you remember, the Prophet said, these are the pillars of Islam. These are the principles of Islam. This does not constitute the complete Islam. Many people are misunderstanding that if they do these five things, they become very good Muslims. These are only the five pillars. And any engineer will tell you that if the pillar is strong, then hopefully the structure will be strong. If the foundation is strong, the structure will be strong. So if you follow these five pillars correctly, then inshallah the structure will be correct. And the other structures, the do's and don'ts, I mentioned the Holy Quran. How a person should lead his life, I mentioned the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran says in Surah Dhariyat, chapter 51, verse number 56, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَىٰ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That we have created the jinn and the men, not but to worship me. That means God Almighty created the jinn and the men only to worship him. What is the meaning of the Arabic word ibadah? It comes from the root word abd, which means slave, which means servant. Ibadah means serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, means following his commandments. Many people have misconception that salah, prayer, is the only form of ibadah. Salah is one of the high forms of ibadah, but it's not the only form of ibadah. Whatever commandments you follow of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you follow them, you are doing ibadah. If you abstain from prohibited food, like alcohol, Quran says in Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 90, that alcohol is prohibited, you are doing ibadah of Almighty God. If you're honest in your business, you are doing ibadah, you are doing worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you love your neighbors, as the Quran says in Surah Ma'un chapter 107, verse number 1 to 7, that provide neighborly needs, you are doing ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you abstain from backbiting, speaking ill about people behind the back, you are doing worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran says in Surah Humza, chapter 104, it says, Wa illul humza That would to every kind of scandal monger and backbiter. Quran says in Surah Hujra, chapter 49, verse number 11 and 12, that do not defame others, do not be sarcastic, do not call others by nickname. 
Avoid suspicion. For suspicion in many cases is a crime. Do not speak ill about other people behind the back. Are you ready to eat the dead meat of your brother? Means if you backbite, if you speak ill about anybody else behind the back, it is as though you are eating the dead meat of your brother. What does it mean? See, eating dead meat is prohibited in the Holy Quran. Eating dead meat of your brother is double crime. Even the cannibals that eat human beings, they don't eat the dead meat of their own brother. So Quran says that if you backbite, if you speak ill about other people behind the back, it is a double crime. First, speaking ill about anyone without proof is a crime. Speaking ill about anyone without proof behind the back is double crime because he cannot support himself. Eating dead meat is a crime. Eating dead meat of a brother is double crime. So Quran says that if you backbite, are you ready to eat the dead meat of your brother? And Allah gives the reply, nay, you would abhor it. So if you abstain from backbiting, you are doing worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are doing ibadah. Quran says in Surah Isra chapter 17 verse 23 and 24, that I have ordained for you that you worship none but me. And that you be kind to your parents. After worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says, be kind to your parents. And if any one of them, or both of them, reach old age, do not say a word of contempt. Don't even say oof to your parents. But lower to them your wing of humility and address them with honor. And pray to Almighty God that bless them as they cherished me in childhood. You have to love and respect your parents. If you love and respect your parents, you are doing worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Monasticism, celibacy is prohibited in Islam. Our beloved Prophet said in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 7, chapter number 3, in the book of Niqah, hadith number 4, it said that, O oh, young people, whoever has the means to get married, should get married. For it will help you to lower the gaze and guard your modesty. The Prophet said, whoever does not marry is not of me. It's compulsory in Islam to marry. So if you marry, you are doing worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you have sex with your wife and abstain from adultery, you are doing worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Quran says in Surah Isra chapter 17 verse 32, that come not close to adultery. For it's an evil deed, it's an unjust deed, an evil opening road to other evil. It's a shameful deed, an evil opening road to other evil. So if you have sex with your wife and abstain from adultery, you are doing ibadah, worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you love your wife, you are doing ibadah. The Holy Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 19, that treat your wives on a footing of equity and kindness even if you dislike her. Means even if you dislike your wife, the Quran says you should love her and treat her with equity. If you dress up modestly, that's ibadah, that's worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in short, any commandments you follow of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is worship of Almighty God. If you abstain from those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited, you are doing ibadah, you are doing worship. Islam has got a dual role. It caters to the body as well as to the soul body as well as to the soul. There is not a single teaching of Islam which is against humanity. People may think this teaching of Islam is wrong due to lack of knowledge. They may have less information either about Islam or about the statistics of the world. Therefore they may think that this teaching of Islam, you know marrying more than one wife, okay it's a wrong teaching. But if you have the correct information, the correct knowledge of Islam, and the correct attitude of the world, there is not a single teaching of Islam which is against humanity. Every teaching of Islam is either beneficial to the body or the soul of the human being. The Holy Quran says in Surah Mulk, chapter 67, verse number 2, that Allah has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. This life that you're leading is a test for the hereafter. It's a test we are undergoing. If we pass, we go to heaven. If we fail, we go to hell. It's a test for the hereafter. And the criteria for salvation was recited by a young Kari, Brother Kamil, in the beginning of the talk. He recited 
the Surah Al Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3. It says, Wal Asr, Inna al Insan la fi khusr, illa ladina amanu wa amil salihati wa tawasaw bil haq wa tawasaw bil sab. That by the token of time, man is verily in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deed, those who exhort people to truth, that to dawah and islah, those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. These are the minimum four criteria for any human being to go to heaven. He should have faith, he should have righteous deed, he should exhort people to truth, and exhort people to patience and perseverance. Only having one or two or three of these criteria will not transport you to heaven. You should have all the four criteria for a human being to enter Jannah. The Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 256, Like Deen, there is no compulsion religion. But many people quote this and stop. The complete verse says, there is no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. You have to present the truth. You cannot force anyone at the point of the sword, at the point of the gun. That's not allowed in Islam. You have to present the truth. If he agrees, Alhamdulillah. Well and fine. If he doesn't agree, you can't force anyone. There is no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. But we have to present the truth to them. I was asked by the organizer that I should give work as far as possible a short talk and spend more time for the question answer session. There are many misconceptions of Islam amongst the non-Muslims, even amongst the Muslims. But today the gathering is especially for non-Muslims, that whatever misconception they have, however stupid it may sound, however illogical it may sound, however offensive it may sound, no problem, I can take it. You are most welcome to ask any question on Islam, you are welcome to criticize Islam, no problem, I'll only ask you, why do you? Why do you say that Quran is wrong? If you know something about the Quran, you are most welcome to clarify any doubt. This is the opportunity. Normally we don't have religious gathering after which there's an open question answer session. I normally prefer having a question answer session. Whatever doubts are there, some people may think that why do Muslims marry more than one wife? Why don't they have pork? Why are they circumcised? Why do they have non veg Etc. etc. Whichever questions you have, this is the opportunity to clarify. Believe me, I will not get offended. You are most welcome to ask any question. If you feel that this teaching of Islam is not right, speak it up. You are most welcome to ask any question, clarify any doubt. This is your best opportunity. So that even if you want to criticize, I can take it. I am young, but I can take it. That's my job. It's my field. I would like to end my talk by giving the question of the Holy Quran from Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 125, which says, That is, invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank our brother, Dr. Zakir Naik, for a very enlightening and thought-provoking talk on the principles of Islam, the articles of faith, and the duties and responsibilities and obligations of Muslims. In view of the remarks of our distinguished speaker, I must announce an amendment to the rules of this evening's session with pleasure. The amendment is this, that your questions are not necessarily confined to Islam and Universal Brotherhood. They can be on absolutely any aspect of Islam in view of the willingness of the distinguished speaker to entertain all questions related to Islam. I also have the pleasant duty of announcing that a little book is to be released. It is titled The Quran in Plain English for Children and Young People. This little volume deals with the last part of the Qur'an, the 30th juz or the 30th part. 
and it is by an authoress, Iman Torres Al Hanif. I will request Dr. Zakir Naik to release the first copy of this book, which will be received by our brother Muhammad Abdullahi. There are two ways of asking questions, ladies and gentlemen. Either you can stand up and there is a portable mic, you can speak into it, or if you prefer, you're welcome to come over here and ask, or you can do it by means of written slips. In all cases, I would like to remind you to please state your name, your occupation, profession or business and to please keep your question brief and to the point and please bear in mind that there are lots of other people who would also like to ask questions. I am Vyas, a retired Central Government employee. I have two questions to ask. I thank the organizers for this very nice meet and as already our Highness has said, we have many more meetings like this. It was very highly enlightening and we have learned many new things which we did not know about Islam. It was really, I should say, a very good meeting. And I congratulate the organizers on My questions are, freedom of expression is an universally accepted principle. Why then a death sentence has been impressed imposed on Mr. Salman Rushdie. Continuation, what are the fundamental ideological differences existing between the Shias and the Sunnis which lead to their intermittent clashes? What are the remedies? Thank you. The brother asked a very good question. That does Islam permit freedom of expression? <coughs> if so, <coughs> then why was the death sentence given to Salman Rushdie? There is a complete answer it is given in this cassette. It is a press debate organized by the Bombay Union of Journalists in Bombay by the group of Times of India, Indian Express, the journalists, Bombay Union of Journalists. And the topic was, is religious fundamentalism a stumbling block to the freedom of expression? It was held after the death sentence was passed on Tasnima Nasri, who wrote the book, Lajja. This gives the detail. And in this debate, there was a Hindu priest, there was a Christian priest, there was a person who translated Lajja into Marathi, Ashok Shani, and myself from the Islamic side. This is a very good debate. This gives the detail about the religious freedom. Some people say that in other religions, there is total religious freedom. Anything you can say. Some people say that religious freedom is a stumbling block in the freedom of expression, while the other speaker came and said there is no stumbling block. In Islam, it depends upon the situation. I can't give a blanket yes or no. <clears throat> in short, I would say, if the freedom of expression is given, for example, for anyone to praise anyone, to glorify anyone, if he wants to praise anyone, glorify anyone, etc., Islam gives full permission as long as he doesn't harm anyone and it's with proof. Point number one. He can say anything as long as it does not harm anyone. If it doesn't harm anyone, it's fine. Point number two. If it harms anyone, there are two things. With proof and without proof. If it harms anyone, for example, abusing anyone, as the Quran says, do not call each other with nickname, abusing anyone. With proof or without proof, just for slandering, it's not allowed. If you speak against someone with proof, with proof, it's allowed. For example, I'm working in a company. If the company is corrupted, I'm speaking against the corruption of the company. 
Islam gives full freedom of expression. Full. I should go and say that this company is corrupted, the boss is cheating the human beings, etc., etc., with proof. But I cannot say the boss is cheating without proof. Without proof, if I say I have got no, no right. If I see, if I allege anything against any human being, I should have proof. Again, like Islam, if I say anything to any woman, even if I put a small allegation against a chastity, against a modesty, Quran says produce four witness. If I can't, you get 80 lashes. That means you can't, like, in most of the countries in America and England, you can abuse the girl and get away with it. In Islam, if you abuse the girl and call her any name, any bad name, if you can't get four witnesses, you get 80 lashes. That is, you protect the modesty. Which proof you allowed? With proof, if you get, for example, if I'm working in a company, and I get proof that this particular boss is corrupting the people, he's, he's corrupted, I can do. With proof. Islam gives permission of full freedom of expression. There are certain things with proof also you cannot say. For example, if I'm working in the Indian Army, I've got proof about his secret, I can't go and sell it to the enemy. So here freedom of expression is not allowed. With proof, if it causes loss, to the people who I'm working, if it's against the country, I'm taking the secrets of a government and selling it to the enemy. Why? To profit with it money. Just to get a few lakh rupees, Islam does not give permission. So for freedom of expression, depending which type of freedom do you believe in? If you believe that I can slander anyone, I can abuse anyone, and then say it's freedom of expression, Islam does not give permission. Islam does not give permission. Same thing, if you analyze, that this book was released in UK, a book on Salman Rushdie. It was released in UK, and I've given my views on that. You can refer to the video cassette. That there was a person who came from America, and he used a four-letter word for Margaret Thatcher's policy. He was banned. See, England believed in freedom of expression, but because they spoke against Margaret Thatcher, against Margaret Thatcher, he was banned. The same Salman Rushdie, besides, I know he has done wrong things, he has abused the prophet, he has abused our mothers, he has abused, he has done wrong. Besides that, he has abused the whole humankind. People are not reading the book properly. I don't want to say the things he has said. He, the first page, he abuses the Londoners. I can't use that word. I can't use that word, it's an offensive word. It doesn't, I can't use it. And he says, Maggie the he calls her a female dog. Islam does not give permission. Did they have proof to call her a female dog? I don't want to use that word. It's a pilot word. And he says to Maggie offensive things. Maggie is short form for Margaret Thatcher. So Islam does not give permission. He even abuses Ram and Sita in that book, which people don't know. I don't want to say what he said to Ram and Sita. I don't want to say that. The best thing I congratulate is Rajiv Gandhi. The first person, the first Prime Minister of any country in the world, he banned the book. I congratulate him. He may not be knowing that he abused Ram and Sita in the book. Salman Rushdie, he abused Ram and Sita. Rajiv Gandhi may not be knowing. But I have read the book. Though it is banned, I have read the book. I have read the book. Since I speak on that book, I have read the book. So if anyone abuses anyone, if anyone abuses even your sister or mother, without proof, it's not allowed. Even the Bible, if you read, the Bible says in the book of Leviticus, it says that anyone that blasphemeth the Lord, stone him to death. Anyone that blasphemeth the Lord, stone him to death. So if anyone depends upon the severity of the crime, you can give punishment. So in that way, if anyone abuses anyone without proof, without anything, Islam does not permit that. That's the reason there are certain people who call death sentence, etc. There are four options given in the Holy Quran. In Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 33 to 35, it says that anyone who wages a war against God Almighty and his prophet and creates mischief in the land, either exile him, either execute him, chop off of his hands and limbs, left hand and right leg, or right hand and left leg, or crucify him. Four options. Either execute, either crucify, chop off opposite limbs, or exile him. See, this is a strict punishment. Why? To see to it that no one takes undue advantage. See in Islam, if anyone commits rape, there's capital punishment. People may think it's a barbaric law. People come and tell me, Islam, in this age of science and technology, capital punishment. See, all the religions speak good things. Hinduism says you should not tease a girl, you should not rape a girl. Christianity says that, Islam says the same. The difference in Islam is, Islam shows you a way how to achieve that state in which no one will rape any girl. 
Every man, whenever he looks at a woman, any brazen thought comes, he should lower his gaze. Whenever he looks at a woman, the Quran says he should lower his gaze. That's his hijab. For the woman, she should be completely covered. The only part that can be seen is the face and the hand up to the wrist. <coughs> this is the hijab. If two twin sisters are walking down the street, one is wearing the Islamic hijab, complete body covered, the only part that is seen is the face and the hand up to the wrist, and the other girl is wearing a skirt or a mini. If round the corner there is a hooligan waiting for a catch, which girl will it is? Which girl will it is? If two twin sisters are equally beautiful, walking down the street, one is wearing a skirt and a mini, one is properly covered, who will it is? The girl wearing the skirt and the mini. So Quran says the hijab has been prescribed to you in Surah Azab, chapter 33, verse 59, so that it will prevent molestation. And in America, every day, more than 1,900 cases of rape take place in America. And if anyone rapes, the Islamic Sharia says capital punishment. People say it's a barbaric law. I ask the non-Muslim, that if someone rapes your wife or sister, and if you omit the judge, what punishment will you give? All of them said that I will kill the rapist. If someone rapes your wife and sister, and if you omit the judge, what punishment will you give? Death penalty. Some went to the extreme of saying, I will torture him to death. I am asking you the question that if you implement the Sharia in America, where more than 1,900 cases of rape take place in America every day, that every man may look at a woman who should lower his gaze, the woman should be properly dressed up, and after that if someone rapes, capital punishment, will the rate of rape increase, will it decrease or will it remain the same? It will decrease. That's the reason the least rate of rape in any country of the world is in Saudi Arabia. All religion speaks good, but Islam shows you a way how to achieve that good state. Therefore, Islam doesn't agree in slandering anyone. No one can abuse my mother and get away in an Islamic country. In other countries, there is freedom of expression. Islam believes in freedom of, of expression where it is beneficial for humanity. Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse number 81, 82, وَقُلْ جَا الْحَقْ وَزَاكَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ ذَهُوكَ That when truth is heard again, falsehood, falsehood perishes. For by its nature, falsehood is bound to perish. If it's beneficial for the humanity, Islam promotes freedom of expression. If it is not, then Islam does not allow it. Regarding the second part of the question, what is the difference between the Shias and the Sunnis? Brother, the difference is a political difference. Actually, in Islam, there's nothing like Shia Sunni. There's no Shia Sunni mentioned in the Holy Quran. Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 103, Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. There's nothing like Shia Sunni in Islam. This came later on, centuries afterwards, due to political differences. In Islam, Muslims are only of one category, Muslims at all. There's no subcategory in Muslims like Shia Sunni or anything. Because Quran clearly states in Surah An Am, chapter 6, verse number 159, anyone who makes sex, division in the religion of Islam, he has nothing to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Means making sex is prohibited in Islam. The difference between Shia and Sunni is a political difference. It's not a religious difference. Hope that answers the question. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Balachandran. I work for an advertising agency in the city. This question of mine, it pertains to the Indian Muslims. In today's world, as things exist, the Indian Muslim has two identities. One is the religious identity, which you get by the virtue of the fact that you are a Muslim. And secondly, it is the cultural identity, which comprises of basically the Hindu elements. And there seems to be a conflict in the minds of Muslims, at least some of them. But uh, to cut a long story short, I have some friends in this August audience who observe certain things which are essentially Hindu in nature. There are people who consult astrologers with their horoscopes, Muslim friends. There are people who observe Rahu Kalam. All right. If, if this is a conflict, is there a conflict? Should there be a conflict? Should this conflict exist? And what does Quran say about it? Those people, would you disown them? saying that they are uh, less Muslim than you or, everybody, or anybody else here. I hope uh, Dr. Zaki Naik will throw some light on this. Thank you. The brother asked a very good question uh, about the Indian Muslim. As, as a matter of fact, this question can be posed to any Muslim in any part of the world. That if you are a Muslim, can you follow the cultural aspect 
of any other race, any other community, any other religion, any other particular nation, whether it be India, whether it be America, whether it be Europe. Basically, brother, a Muslim, by definition, as I said in my talk, is a person who submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is a person who submits his desire to God Almighty. Now, can we follow Indian culture, American culture, Western culture? As long as, brother, that culture doesn't go against the basics of Islam, you can follow. If it does not go against the principles of Islam, you can very well follow. For example, people tell me that can a woman wear sari? It's an Indian culture. I said, yes, she can wear if she follows the six criteria. The six criteria for hijab in Islam for a woman is that a complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen is the face and the hand of the wrist. The clothes that she wears should be loose, it should not be tight, but it reveals the figure. Third is, it should not be transparent where you can see through. Fourth is, it should not resemble. It should not resemble that of any other unbeliever. Fifth is, it should not be glamorous where they attract the opposite sex. Sixth is, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. So if you want to wear a star in the Islamic way, you should see to it that the pallor that you take should cover your head. Not a single strand of hair should be seen. Even the belly should not be seen. No other part of the body should be seen. Very loose body. Don't be attacked when you can't even walk properly. So if you follow this, Alhamdulillah. You are following the Indian culture without breaking the law. But if you say, I want to wear a sari with a short sleeve blouse and showing the belly, it's not going to be permission. It's not allowed. Similarly, if a Muslim says, I want to wear a sari with I want to wear a shirt or a medium woman's face. It's not allowed. So if you can very well follow the culture, as long as the culture doesn't go against the principles and teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because for us, the teaching of our Creator is more important. Because He has created us. How we have to support our nation. But the person who gave life to us in this world is God Almighty. So we owe more respect to Him than to anyone else in the world. Than to any other government in the world. Otherwise, we have to respect the other people. If it doesn't go against the teaching of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can follow it. Regarding astrology, you said that can we talk about fortune telling, etc. There's a verse in the Holy Quran from Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 90, which says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amunu, O you who believe, in the malkhamru wal maithuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal azlam wal aslamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rich sum min amali shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork. Ashtanibullah lakum tuflihun, gambling, Quran says, having intoxicants, worshipping anyone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and fortune telling. These are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from the handiwork that may prosper. I am not saying whether anyone can predict the future or not. Most of the people who say they can predict the future, they are pulling a fast one. Quran does not say no one can predict or people can predict. There may be few people who may have learned this science, but every person who you go to, you say, see the person who I go to is a very good Jyotish. Most of them, they take for a ride. There are even computers, you put the age and you get the answer. And there was a survey done in America that one professor of psychology, he taught a student of classroom of 100 students and at the end of the week, after the of one week, he said that I will write each one's nature on the chit. Each one's nature, what did he do, what will he do on a piece of chit. And after I tell, everyone opened the chit simultaneously. And then you give your opinion whether I was right or wrong. So the professor wrote, student A, what's his nature, about future, etc. Student B, to everyone, he gave a chit. And then after everyone received the chit, the professor said, no, open the chit and read. So everyone opened the chit and they read. And they gave the opinion that more than 90% of the students said that the professor was 100% correct. The professor was 100% correct. The remaining 8-9% said that he was 95% correct. After that, the professor said, I wrote the same thing for all 100 students. See, if I say something bad is going to happen to you within one month, something bad is going to happen. Even if a thousand good things happen, something bad is bound to happen. If I say something good happened to you last year, even if a thousand bad things happened, something good did happen. So these are vague statements which are always true. Therefore, when you read in the paper, Libra is this and so and so is this and Leo is this and all this is just pulling a fast one. Pulling a fast one. 
They put the Quran says they do not indulge. There may be few people who may be experts. I'm not saying no. But the Quran says that if you know things you should not know, it will cause you more harm. Quran says abstain from fortune telling. Why? Because the things which you should not know, it will cause you more harm if you come to know. For example, if you go to a, a astrologer, he will tell you, see, you're going to fail. That person has come out first in the classroom always. The astrologer says he will fail and he doesn't study and he fails. And he blames you, he blames God Almighty. See, the person pulled a fast one. The astrologer came out to be true. Why? Because the person had blind belief in him. If you were studied, you would have passed. Therefore, Islam says, the Holy Quran says, do not indulge in fortune telling. If any Muslim does that, if he goes against the commandments of the Holy Quran, surely he is not a good Muslim. He is not following this principle of Islam. Other principles he may be following. Hope that answers the question. I should like to make a request of our Muslim friends, please. At dinner time, could you please help us and see that our non-Muslim friends who are our guests have dinner comfortably and calmly. Thank you. Now, could you bear for, with me for a minute, sir? A number of questions have come here in writing and I think some of them do deserve an answer. We have a question from Mr. S. Madhuseshan businessman. Would you stand up please, sir, Mr. Mother Sation? Are you there? Okay, thank you, sir. Mr. Mother Sation's question is a very interesting question. It is, what is the difference between the ideologies of Islam and the ideology of Hinduism? And a connected question from Mr. V. S. Ramakrishnan, advocate. Would you stand up, sir, Mr. V. S. Ramakrishnan? Thank you. The Holy Quran says Allah is the beginning and He is the end. Wal awwal wal akhir. But Hindu Upanishads also say God is one, He is present in all, being Yeko Deva Sarva Bhuteshu Buddha from the from the Tato Upanishad. What is your comment about this? Two connected questions. Both the questions are very good. What are the similarities between Hinduism and Islam? What's the difference in the ideology? And the Hindu Upanishad, which I have read, says that God is one. God is present everywhere. And that the Holy Quran also says that Allah is the beginning and He is the end. The major difference, if you analyze, between Islam and Hinduism. And if you ask a common Hindu that how many gods does he worship in? Some may say three, some may say ten, some may say hundred, while others may say thirty-three crores. That is three hundred and thirty million. But if you ask a learned man like the advocate who has mentioned very well from the scripture that how many gods should the Hindus worship, they will tell you one. But they believe in a philosophy known as anthropomorphism. Many people they believe in a philosophy known as anthropomorphism. That means God Almighty, He takes forms. God Almighty. And the philosophy is good. That if you analyze, if you just hear it on the faith of it, it says that God Almighty, and this many religions say, not only Hinduism, many other religions like Christianity also says the same, that God Almighty, He is so pure, He is so holy, that He doesn't know how does a human being feel when he's hurt. How does the human being feel when someone troubles him? So God Almighty came in the form of a human being to lay down the rules for the human being, the good and bad for the human being. On the face of it, it's a good logic. That God Almighty, He is so pure, He to set the rules for the human beings, He came on the face of the earth to set the rules for the human beings. Because He's so holy, He's so pure, He doesn't know what's good, what is bad for the human being. So I give the example that suppose I create a VCR a video cassette recorder. I'm an engineer. And if I create, if I manufacture one video cassette recorder, do I have to become a video cassette recorder to know what is good or what is bad for the video cassette recorder? No. I just write an instruction manual that when you want to play the cassette, insert the video cassette. Press the play button, it will play. Press the stop button, the video cassette will stop. 
Don't drop it from a height, it will get damaged. Don't immerse it in water, it will get spoiled. I write an instruction manual. If you say human beings is a machine, I would say it is the most complicated machine. Doesn't it require an instruction manual? The instruction manual for the human beings is the Holy Quran. It is the Holy Quran. The do's and don'ts for the human beings, the last and final instruction manual is given in the Holy Quran. What is good, what is bad for the human beings. Now the common Hindu, he believes in the philosophy known as pantheism. A pantheism. That means everything is God. What the common Hindu says, that the tree is God, the sun is God, the moon is God, the human being is God, the monkey is God, the snake is God. The major difference between Hindus and Muslims is, what the Muslims say, everything is God's, with the apostrophe is, everything belongs to God. The tree belongs to God, the sun belongs to God, the moon belongs to God, the human being belongs to God, the monkey belongs to God, the snake belongs to God. So the major difference is, the Hindus say, everything is God. The Muslims say, everything is God's, G-O-D with apostrophe is. If we can solve this difference of apostrophe is, we Hindus and Muslims will be united. How to do it? Quran says in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse 64 says, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa in bainana bainakum. That come to common terms as between us and you. What is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shayyam. That we associate a partner with him. How do we come to common terms? Let's analyze the scriptures of the Hindus and the Muslims. If you read the Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita says in chapter number 7, Verse number 19 to 23, it says that all those who worship the demigods, all those that do idol worship their materialistic people. Who says that? The Bhagavad Gita. I'm giving the reference. Chapter number 7, verse number 19 to 23. Among the holy scriptures, the most sacred of the Hindu scriptures are the Vedas. There are four Vedas. The Rig Ved, the Rig Ved, the Ajur Ved, the Sam Ved and the Atharva Ved. The Rig Ved deals with songs of praises. The Rig Ved deals with songs of praises. The Ajur Ved, the Ajur Ved deals with sacrificial formulas. The Sam Ved deals with melody. And the Atharva Ved deals with magical formulas. If you read the Ajur Ved, the Ajur Ved says in chapter number 32, verse number 3, Na Tasya Pratima Asti, it's a Sanskrit quotation, Na Tasya Pratima Asti, of that God no image can be made. The same Yajur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number 8 says, God is imageless and bodiless. He has got no form, he has got no body. Same Yajur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number 9 says, All those who worship the Asambhuti, Asambhuti are the natural things like air, water, fire. All those who worship the Asambhuti, they are in darkness. And the verse continues, Andhatma Prabhishanti, Ya Asambhuti Vupaste. They are entering more in darkness, those who worship the Asambhuti. Sambhuti means the created things. Who says that? I am not quoting the Quran. I am quoting the Yajur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number 9 says, If you worship the Sambhuti, the created things like table, chair, etc., you are entering more in darkness. The Hindu scripture says, Ek kam braham dustya naste, niya naste naste kinchan. Bhagwan ek hi hai, dusra nahi hai. Nahi hai, nahi hai, zara bhi nahi hai. There is only one God, not a second one. Not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. The same Rig Ved, which is the most sacred of all the Vedas. The Rig Ved says in volume number 8, chapter number 1, verse number 1, March Danyadi Sansad, all praises are due to him alone. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Same as the Holy Quran. Surah Fatiha, chapter number 1, verse number 1 and 2. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. The same Rig Ved, volume number 6, chapter number 45, verse number 16 says, Ya ek it mushtihi, there is only one God, worship him alone. Kul Allah huad. Says Allah one and only. So if we read the scriptures of the Hindus and the Muslims and we analyze, we know that all the religious scriptures of all the various religions speak about Tawheed, speak about the concept of one God. So if we read the scriptures and we know the difference of apostrophe, yes, the Hindus and Muslims will be united. Hope that gives the answer to both the questions. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have received a note here which says, please give chance for ladies. I assure you that there is no discrimination against the ladies here. They are most welcome to ask questions. The same choices are open to them. Either, either 
if they feel like it, they can come over to the mic here and speak. I think there's a port portable mic also going around, and they're also open to, it is open to them to ask questions by means of slips. Now, I think we have a gentleman waiting here to ask a question. I'm David Asmanikam, the pastor of Seventh Day Adventist Christian Church. I have a question to Dr. Noik. If God is one, He has sent a lot of messengers to this world. If Islam believes in a messenger called Moses, the prophet, peace be unto him, Christianity also believes that Moses is one of their prophets too. Now Moses, the prophet, wrote the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. In these books of law, he has revealed more to this humanity. Both Islam and Christianity claims that Moses is their prophet. In his revelation, he has got Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 3 to 17. It is very well written that the Lord is the Almighty Creator. Now my question is within this frame, which is verse number 8, Exodus 20, chapter, uh, verse number 8, which says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy for in which the Lord has created the entire world in six days and on seventh day he rested. If Islam claims Moses as a prophet and Christianity also claims as Moses as a prophet, why so indifference in the revelation? Could you please answer? The brother has The pastor has asked a very good question. I would love to answer each and every point. He has spoken a few sentences in which I believe there are ten questions for me. But the Nawab Sahib is saying be brief, the coordinator is saying be brief. It's difficult. It's difficult because I'm a student of comparative religion. I've studied the Bible, I've studied the Vedas, the Bhagavad Gita, the Quran, and I love, I love, I love talking, discussion, to come to know the truth. This guy, peace be upon you, said, seek the truth and the truth shall free you. The truth shall free you. Brother, he quoted, he said the Ten Commandments are mentioned in Exodus, chapter number 20, verse number 3 to 8. He didn't quote the first verses, I quote the first few verses. If you read the Exodus, chapter number 20, verse number 2 says, that thou shalt have no other God besides me. Thou shalt make no graven image of thee, of the likeness, in the heavens above, in the earth beneath, and in the water beneath the earth. Thou shalt not serve them, nor bow down to them, for thy God is a jealous God. Who says that? The same exit is to give the quotation, but to jump to verse number 8 directly. The first few verses says that thou shalt make no graven image of thee, of the likeness in the heavens above, in the earth beneath, and in the water beneath the earth. For thy God is a jealous God. You cannot bow down to anyone, nor worship them. Same as Islam, same as Hinduism. No images, no idol worship, worship only one true God. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said the same thing what Moses has said in the book of Deuteronomy. Chapter number 6, verse number 4, he said, in Hebrew, Shama Israelo adna elahaino adna ichad, that your Israel, the Lord, our God, is one God. Coming to the question, the main question, there were many questions in it. I, time doesn't permit me to answer all. The main question is, that why is the difference of Sabbath? See, I do agree that the Jews, they believed that Saturday was the Sabbath. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew. You are a pastor, you may be knowing. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 17 to 20 says, that think not that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. Jesus Christ, he's speaking in the Bible in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Matthew, that think not that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. I have come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For unless the heavens and the earth pass away, not one jot or a tittle shall pass away from the law until all be fulfilled. For whosoever shall break one of the least commandments and teach men to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall keep the commandments and teach men to do so will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 
Pastor, it's from King James Version. It's a verbatim quotation. That unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, in no way shall you enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said that if a Christian has to be a good Christian, you should follow each and every law of the Torah. Whatever Moses said, they have to follow verbatim. Even if one jot or a tittle, if they break, they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Who said that? Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. So that's the question for the Christian. Why don't they observe Saturday as the holy day? You have to ask the Christian. That's the law Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, bought. That I have come not to destroy the law and the prophets, I have, but I have come to fulfill. Now when Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came, he didn't say that. The Holy Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 106, that we have sent revelations, we have given ayats, but we substitute with things which are better or similar. The Quran believed that Musa alayhi salam was the Prophet of God Almighty. The Quran believed that Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was the Prophet of Almighty God. In fact, Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians today do not believe. We believe that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. We are together. But what we believe, as I said earlier, all the previous messengers, they only came for a particular group of people. For example, the Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 49, that Isa alayhi salam was sent as a messenger to the Bani Israel, to the children of Israel. Jesus, peace be upon him, says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 10, verse number 5 and 6, he tells the twelve disciples, Go ye not into the way of the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? The non-Jews, the Hindus, the Muslims, the Christians. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, Go ye not into the way of the Gentiles, enter ye not into the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 15, verse number 24, I have not been sent but to the lost sheep of Israel. That means Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, came only for the Jews, not for the other humanity. Who says that? Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says that. It's mentioned in the Bible. But Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not but as a mercy to the whole of humanity. So, whatever revelation Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received, it need not be the same of the previous revelation. The basic message is same. The basic message, brother, is the same. That you believe in one God, you don't do idol worship, basic is same. But the laws may change. The laws, the superficial laws may change. The Jew does it on Saturday, Christian does it on Sunday, I don't know why. Jesus Christ, peace be upon you, said, you cannot break a single law. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to show that we are different. We are different from the so-called Jews and Christians that are today. Because what we say that Isa alayhi salam, he did not preach Christianity. He preached nothing but Islam. The word Christian is a nickname given by the enemies of Christ. It's mentioned in the Bible in the book of Acts. The pastor may be knowing. It's the book of the New Testament. In the book of Acts, the enemies of Christ nicknamed the followers of Christ as Christians. It's an abuse given to them, which has held on today. But the Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 52, that Jesus Christ was a Muslim. Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 67, that Abraham was not a Jew or a Christian, he was a Muslim. Isa alayhi salam, the Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 52, he was a Muslim. Abraham alayhi salam, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 67, he was not a Jew or a Christian, he was a Muslim. So what law Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, brought in the basic message, it's the same. Believe in one God, not do idol worship, same. The superficiality, so that the human race, when it's reached a certain level, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty thought it fit, that now they can receive the final message. After this, no other messenger will come, no other new law will come. And today's law is the most practical law. For example, Moses, peace be upon him, said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's a very good law that time. People didn't have courts like they have today, like a judge sitting. We didn't. Anyone takes somebody's eyes, you take his eye. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That was the law. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, another spiritual person, another message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 30 to 40, it says, it has been said of the old times, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that whosoever slaps you on one cheek, offer him the other. 
Whosoever asks for a shirt, give him the cloak. If he asks you to walk for one mile, walk twain. It's a remedy. It's a remedy that people took it literally. And a person playing with catty, if he hurt somebody's eye, but naturally it's a mistake. You can't take the eye of that young boy who by mistake hurt your eye. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, bought a remedy which was right that time. Today, depends upon the situation. If he hurts you, actually without a cause and reason, you can take back, you can teach him a lesson. 